Moving on to the fourth plenary session on long term kidney transplant survival in 2021. May I invite the speaker, Dr. Sundaram Hariharan. Now I invite the chairpersons for this plenary session Dr. Chako K. Jacob, Dr. S. Sundar, Dr. Ebi Abraham M., and Dr. Josh Paul. Over to the chairpersons. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate your getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, so, uh, Hari, to talk to us on the, on the question which probably every transplant patient and their family member will be asking. How long do I expect this to last? So I will ask uh, Sundar to introduce Hari because they've been close associates for much long, for a very long time. But just one brief word that uh, Hari is one of our distinguished alumnus from the who underwent part of the training in CMC Velour and has really distinguished himself in the US. Sundar, would you be kind enough to introduce Hari? Thank you, Chako. I'm in Bombay. I'm not in the US today. <laughs> oh, good for you. Lucky. Uh, thank you, Chako, sir. And uh, I thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Vekute and uh, Abhi Avram and others for inviting me to chair a session with uh, my teacher, Professor Chako Jacob and Abhi Abraham and others. Uh, Hari actually needs no introduction, as Chako rightly said, uh, that he's trained from CMC Bellore. He is also a, a student of Dr. Mani, one of the few nephrologists trained by two great institutions, Dr. Mani and CMC Bellore. And um, we were uh, sort of batchmates, and Hari was one of the, probably, I would say, the most intelligent nephrologist I have seen in my career, and any problem I have, uh, I discussed with him. The great thing about Hari is a great academician. He made a big name in US. In fact, the first NEGM paper, even now, the value of serum creatinine in the long-term follow-up transplant. I put his picture and serum creatinine. I still follow that. Despite all markers, I think Hari still believes in serum creatinine, which is a very great thing. And recently, recent paper has made him into a rock star. And he's being interviewed by CNN, BBC, and whatnot. Uh, currently, Hari works in the... Uh, famous Tarzel Transplant Institute, the director of the transplant service there. And the, all of us know about Tarzel and he is doing a lot of good things. And he has got an excellent team of uh, colleagues. And uh, I will not waste much time coming in between you and Hari. Hari, the floor is yours because if I start introducing, talking personal things, it will go into many, many days. So uh, over to you, Hari. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon, everyone. As I mentioned, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sundar. It's nice to see many of our friends here. Um, uh, essentially, I was telling Sundar a few days back, I'm visiting uh, Bombay to see my mom, and here I am giving a talk from uh, Mumbai. So the topic is, uh, the topic of long-term long survival, as Dr. Chako has already mentioned, it's important for everyone, not just for the transplanters. It's very important for patients in the whole healthcare system. I've been focusing on this for about last three or four decades or so. I'm going to share with you uh, on the data which we have published recently. Let's start with the objectives. The objectives of this, the participants will understand the improvements in long-term survival after kidney transplantation, and will also identify some of the increasing unfavorable variables impacting survival. I will also discuss about some of the immunological, medical, and social determinants impacting survival. And more importantly, the article also highlights opportunities for further improvement in survival, which is essentially should be the focus for all the junior faculty members and students. Let's spend a half a minute on this. What is long? What is term? What is survival? I think it's very subjective. If I see a 30-year-old patient coming in for transplant evaluation, what is long should be 30 years or 40 years. If it is a 70-year-old patient undergoing transplantation, the long term should be 15 years or so. When it comes to survival, are we talking about kidney? Are we talking about patient or both? I think both are important. Patients want to lead a good quality life and they want to survive longer and maintain a good quality of life. So these things you have to address in the individualized fashion rather than using a loose terminology in long-term survival. We published our first data way back at about 20 years back in the New England Journal of Medicine on long-term kidney survival after transplantation from data from 1988 to 1986. For those who don't know, United States started collecting the data from October of 1987, 
So there is a volume of information, rich information available to the U.S. database. In that particular manuscript, what we mentioned was very simple. We evaluated one year survival after living donor transplant, as well as after disease donor transplantation. The top panel is after living donor transplantation stratified according to the year, and the recent years the survival is better than those which were done in 1988. That is also true for the living and disease donor transplantation. And more importantly, this was the first manuscript, the first study to address the fact the post one year survival after living donor transplantation and disease donor transplantation shown on the slides in the right panel, it shows improvements in the survival. The point I would like to make at this time is these improvements occurred when they did not have mycophenol amorphitol, did not have tacrolimus. It is the overall immunosuppressive management or the medical management that has resulted in the improvement in the long term survival. So a little over a year back, I was asked to write a review article on long-term survival. It took nearly about 10 months to complete this article. During the pandemic, I closed myself in, the, in my closet and worked on this manuscript. This was really a hard one to accomplish because it has to be simplified and I have to thank my co-authors Ajay Israni from the University of Minnesota and Gabriel Danovich. We are close friends and we worked very hard to put this data together. First, let's look at the numbers. If you look at the numbers, we stratified patients into a few categories. We stratified patients into four years to make it simpler in terms of the bar diagram. If you look at the living donor transplantation way back uh, in 1996 onwards, every, four, every year we were transplanting approximately 4,000. Now we are transplanting about, I would say, six to 7,000. But if you really look at carefully, the living donor transplantation has remained pretty flat for the last 20 years or so. But if you look at the disease donor transplantation, each year is approximately used to be about 8,000, and that number has really skyrocketed. So every four years, we are transplanting 53,000 transplant, which is equivalent to approximately, you're talking about 13,000, and now it is reaching even 14,000 transplant. So the total number of transplant during the study period, the total number of over 300 and, uh, so, 362,000 transplants have been done in the United States. The power of this database is because of the volume of transplant and more importantly, selective information collected from all the transplants done over the last 25 years. Let's look at some of the simple variables, okay? If you look at during this 25 years, as I'm getting older, as all of us are getting older, the median age of transplant has increased from 48 years to 55 years. The time on dialysis prior to transplantation for disease donor transplantation also increased from 32 months to 58 months, and nearly double. The proportion of patients with diabetes will be transplanted is nearly one third now. And the other important thing in the disease donor transplantation, about every for every five transplant, one transplant is from a donation after cardiac death, and the DGF is approximately about 25% uh, of our patients and uh, develop DGF post-transplantation. If you look at the unfavorable variables after living donor transplantation, you see a similar trend. Median age has increased. The dialysis duration has remained flat, obviously because of the living donor transplantation. Proportion of patients with diabetes has increased. This mean CPRA has slightly gone up, but not substantially. And the last one, which is more important, is the living donor paired exchange. Living donor paired exchange was pretty much nil way back about 20 years back. Now we are doing about 14 or 20 percent of our transplants are living donor paired exchange. And I'm sure you folks in India also have done this living port, living donor paired exchange, and which is a real opportunity for the further optimized transplantation. Let's look at the survival. During this period, what about the patient survival? I've shown three, two graphs here. One on the left side is the living donor transplants, and the right side is a disease donor transplantation. St 
stratified according to the same 40-year period, and it has shown very clearly patient survival in the recent cohort has definitely improved. Patient survival after a disease donor transplant has also improved. Keep in mind, I also shown you the unfavorable variables have really increased in recent years. So despite of the increase in the unfavorable variables, the patient survival after living donor transplantation and disease donor transplantation is improved. What about the graft survival, which is really pivotal for our kidney transplant? Because a lot of patients can undergo transplantation only once in a lifetime, especially in countries like India. If you look at the living donor transplantation survival after in recent years, 2012 to 2015, has really increased, and that is also true for a disease donor transplant. I want to say one other important thing. This is not actuarial survival. This is an actual survival. Actuarial survival always gives you a little better numerical percentage value than the actual survival. And what I'm showing here is the actual survival in the United States. This is the first data in the large data set to show there have been remarkable improvements in the kidney transplant survival over the last 25 years. The other way of looking at it, looking at the patient loss attrition rates. What proportion of, why did they die? I'm not going to go into that. When do they die? And that is shown in these two graphs. One on the left side is a living donor transplant, and on the right side is a disease donor transplant. If you look at less than one year, approximately 2.5% of the patient used to die within one year after, after living donor transplantation. That number has come down to less than 1%. That's remarkable. Between one to five years, two to five percent, two percent of the patients used to die within after between the year one and year five, and that number has come down to little less than 1.5. And the same thing is true. The trend is also seen in patient loss after living donor transplantation between five to ten years. A similar trend is also seen in the disease donor transplantation. You have to say the one year graft loss has come, one year patient loss has come down. One to five year patient loss has slightly decreased, and five to ten years has also decreased. The data is a little bit noisy, but it has still has declined over a period of time. Keep in mind these y axis and this graph and this graph are not the same, but all you have to look at is a trend. But let's look at an important aspect about graft loss after living donor transplantation. So way back when I was in when I I, I went to US in late eighties. I used to practice in practicing transplant, and we used to have a substantial number of patients who used to lose the graft within one year. As you can see in the graph here, six percent of the patients used to lose the graft within one year after transplantation, which is very very high, and now it has come to less than 1.5 percent. If you look at the same thing, the disease donor transplantation, 12 percent of our patients used to lose the graft within one year. That number has come down to approximately uh, four or less than four percent. That's a remarkable improvement to one year survival. But if you look at beyond one year, there was always a debate as the long term survival improved. Has the long term survival improved? Yes, it has. If you look at the decline in the graft loss rate between one to five years and five to ten years, you see a similar trend in living donor after disease and after disease donor transplantation. The other way of uh, representing improvements in the disease donor patient and graft survival from 96 to recent cohort, just look at the 5 and 10 years. Patient survival has improved by 7.29% and 10 years by 6.5%. If you look at the 5 year graft survival has improved by 12% and this is about 11.5%. That is really remarkable. And if you want to look at the percent numerical survival change, you see a similar trend in the five year and 10 years. So these are all play of numbers, but keep in mind our kind of patients we are transplanting today are much different than what we used to transplant 25, 30 years back. So they are quite different. And despite of that, you see a remarkable improvements in the one year uh, and long term kidney transplant survival. In the next 10, 12, 15 minutes or so, I'm not going to cover all aspects. I'm going to highlight some few important points, which are really our bread and butter of transplant nephrology. If you look at immunosuppression, at least in the United States, 
Thymoglobulin is a predominant use for the induction agent, mycophenol amorphitol with CNI, either tacrolimus or cyclosporin, predominantly cyclosporin, to predominantly tacrolimus, in which steroids have been used for the last 25 years. Steroid avoidance has been associated with the high incidence of rejection, so it has not been adopted universally. Non-CNI regimen, either with mTOR or belatasa, with MP and prednisone, the enthusiasm has dampened. The enthusiasm has really decreased over time, mainly because of the high rejection rates, lower long-term patient survival, and belatasa is very expensive. And the logistics of monthly infusion, higher incidence of PTLD should be kept in mind. But the conversion to belatasa has still been successfully done in select patients, and that has been very, very rewarding in a select subset of patients. There are certain new immunosuppressions are under investigation. I am not going to talk about that. The important aspect of kidney transplantation, obviously, kidney donors. If you look at the kidney donors, living donor paired exchange. Living donor paired exchange has gone from, there is a typographical error, it's gone from 0 to 14 percent. The mean is 55.6 that has been a huge bump in the number of living donor transplant we do in the United States. I'm sure uh, certain centers in the, India are also doing this. Living donor paired exchange is done for a blood group and antibody incompatibility. Living donor paired exchange is superior to sensitization. We have to expand living donor paired exchange beyond antibody and blood group to size and age mismatch, epilet mismatch, and CMV mismatch, and that's what we're working on. I'm going to show one slide on the importance of uh, CMV mismatch when you talk about infection. This is not applicable to India. It's applicable to the United States. Essentially, African-American recipients and donors, if they have an apolipo-1 gene, they are susceptible to kidney disease. So if you have a recipient who is undergoing transplantation with homozygosity to this particular gene, they have a lower survival over time. If you have an African-American kidney donor, whether it's a disease donor or living donor, if it's a disease donor, the recipients have a lower survival. If it's a living donor, the recipients have a lower survival. And more importantly, you have to keep in mind, the donors are also at high risk for developing chronic kidney disease. In my opinion, all black donors with the, this particular gene, they, they should be tested for this gene. And if they are positive, they should not be approved for this particular, uh, for kidney donation. So there's a large study going on, NIH-sponsored study, an Apollo study is going on, where this will go on for five years from donors and recipients and collecting information. So stay tuned, and we will have more information on the study over the next five years or so. In the United States, I, was, I published an article way back in 1997, The Importance of Kidney Quality. I published about three or four or five papers using a national data set. And that has completely changed now from the kidney quality, calling from older donor, the ECD kidney. Now we call it KDPI, kidney donor profile index. It has been associated, high KDPI has been associated with lower post-transplant GFR and decreased survival. High KDPI kidneys with prolonged cold ischemia time also have a lower survival. I'm not saying we should not use the kidneys with the high KDPI. We should be cautious. We should be using judiciously and those kidneys. Essentially, high KDPI kidney should be utilized for recipient with shorter lifespan. That's what is a recommendation, and we put that in writing in, the, in our review article in the New England Journal of Medicine. We also have proportion of patients with hep C positive and hep C negative, both in the recipients and donors. Transplantation is superior to dialysis for these recipients. So HIV positive organs and the hep C organs were previously discarded. The organs from HIV positive donors can be given to HIV positive recipient. And keep in mind, half of the so called HIV positive donors are false positive. And thanks to Dori Sege, who was a previous speaker, who was instrumental in creating the HOPE Act. He worked really hard on that to make this possible. And organs from Hep C has also been given to Hep C positive recipients. Now we have started giving to Hep C recipients because we can treat Hep C very efficiently after a few months after transplantation. These things are really... A few other aspects of why the number of transplants have increased. One of them is the opioid crisis, which is a very sad thing in the United States, and I'm not going to talk about that. 
and awareness of transplant, awareness of organ donation, the organ procurement agency, and the importance of transplantation in nephrology has really increased in the last 25 years. All these things have influenced uh, influenced the number of organ transplants. I have to say, I'm very happy. When the time has started in the United States now in the last 35 years or so, the transplantation has become an important field. To give an example, when I was looking for a job in the United States, there are only two jobs available about 25, 30 years back. Now, it's very easy for a transplant nephrologist to find a job in the United States, and I personally have trained many people. Let's look at some of the post-transplant. One of them is a delayed grad function, which is essentially a perfusion injury, which is universal. Delayed grad function after disease donor transplant is seen in one-fourth of patients. And the rate of delayed grad function is increasing in recent months, mainly because the organ distribution has slightly changed, which I'm not going to talk about. And delayed grad function associated with allograft scarring, renal dysfunction, lower survival, and we have published data on that. Hypothermic and pulsal type perfusion can mitigate perfusion injury, but they have not been adopted universally, mainly because of the cost. And we have adopted universally, we have adopted even virtual use of virtual cross match. You don't need a physical cross match. We published a paper early this year in Kidney International. Uh, one of my colleagues, Chetan, published this paper, an important paper, the importance of the virtual cross match. That can reduce the cold ischemia time. And we are also investigating a newer innovative molecule. There are quite a few people are looking at various molecules that can really mitigate perfusion injury which is very important to reduce delayed grad function or reduce perfusion injury, which will have a real good impact and improving long-term survival. I won't go into the depth of acute rejection. We have contributed, our group itself in the last eight years have contributed a lot to the importance of acute rejection. In the bottom line, acute rejection within one year is common. We, can, we should not say we have really conquered acute rejection. TCMR is seen in 10%. ABMR is rare. If you do protocol biopsy, which we do twice a year, the incidence of subclinical rejection is about 10%, and subclinically ABMR is very rare. And more importantly, the so-called borderline or subclinical inflammation is very common. Late rejection can be TCMR or can be most likely ABMR, and more commonly a mixed rejection. Mixed rejection is a real problem. There are a lot of newer molecules have been tried for refractory or persistent or recurrent TCMR or mixed rejection or ABMR. Current therapy for ABMR, they are okay. They are not good enough to really revert the kidney function completely. And we need better therapy for managing acute rejection. More importantly, let's go to the fundamentals of when it comes to T cell rejection. We are looking at lymphocytic rejection, lymphocytic infiltration and allograft to the rejection. That's not really true. We have to phenotype rejection, find out what kind of cells they are. We have to evaluate the, how to resolve, how to evaluate the resolution of rejection. We cannot just believe on repeating biopsy for all individuals. We need to use some biomarkers. We have to identify who are the patients who are having recurrent or persistent rejection. And I am a big believer of epilet matching. Large data comes from uh, Nickerson and his group from Canada, and we are embarking into the epilet matching in both living donor transplant, uh, even after disease donor transplantation, we are looking at that. There are newer treatment modalities which I already mentioned about. So there's a lot of opportunities for young people to really focus on that. I won't spend much time on the non-invasive biomarkers. They are not for prime time yet. In a simple summary, I'll tell about cell-free DNA. It's a non-specific injury marker. It's an expensive serum creatinine. The sensitivity is very low. It can identify ABMR. It cannot differentiate high grades of rejection. It cannot differentiate acute or chronic. And it's expensive. It's not readily available. But there are some genetic markers. They are also injury markers. They are non-alloimmune markers. They are also expensive. And our philosophy is we wrote that immunosuppression should not be decreased based on biomarkers abnormal biomarkers. Biomarkers cannot replace what we do. We talk to the patient, evaluate the patient, do the renal function, do the biopsy when indicated, and use biomarkers as an additional tool. There's a lot of opportunities in this area doing the prospective randomized clinical trial. Combination of biomarkers may be useful, and lowering the cost is a must. 
and it should be used in select population of DGF, beacon nephritis, and recovery from acute rejection. There are future challenges. One thing, low-hanging fruit, I call it, is organ allocation. Let's not believe in just a classic antibody and blood matching. Let's look at a simple technique, what is the CMV matching. We do transplant a lot of high-risk CMV, and we struggle after transplant with terms of recurrent CMV infection, resistant infection, and so on. So here is a donor A ready to give it to recipient A, and this transplant should not be performed because it's a high-risk CMV. Instead, there is a donor B who is negative giving it to a recipient B. It can be done. Instead of that, you can do a cross-transplant, and the end result will be recipient A will have CMV D negative, R negative, recipient B will be D plus and R plus. This has to be implemented, and few of us are working in our center. Some other centers are also implementing this kind of strategy. This will reduce the amount of gancyclovir or valcite required after transplantation in terms of duration. We don't have to worry about monitoring. We don't have to worry about recurrent CMV. We don't have to worry about resistant CMV and so on. That's a huge life saver. I'm not going to talk about much about viral infections. It's there in the text. Dori talked about um, um, COVID, or coronavirus or COVID-19. And we have some papers coming in that area. Let me say something. The newer antiviral agents, combination therapy, may be making a huge difference for CMV infection. There are monoclonal antibodies. We have two trials going on at our center, uh, the newer monoclonal antibody, one for CMV and one for BK. That might make a big difference. And George T. John is going to talk about adoptive T cell therapy, or he may already given his talk. That's a new innovative way of managing um, managing uh, uh, post-transplant viral infection, especially CMV, BK, or uh, EBV positive PTLD. I'm going to skip the uh, COVID part. It's already been covered. Uh, just to say very briefly, third booster dose has been approved. We still see some infections after the third dose, after the second dose, and some in, some of patients can be very sick. Immunosuppressed transplant patients can be really be sick. We have a huge data on 1,500, 1,400 immunosuppressed patients about the immunity and vaccine. I'm not going to be sp spending time on those things that has already been submitted for publication. We are going away from molecule to cell therapy. We don't know where it's going to go. If I look at cell therapy, it's going to have a huge change in adoptive T cell therapy for viral infection. I'm not still convinced whether it will be useful for preventing and treating rejection. Uh, we are participating in dendritic cell therapy and kidney transplantation, potentially to minimize immunosuppression, but I'm going to be uh, optimistic, but I'm going to be cautiously optimistic there. The area of nephrology I always interests is GM. I am still fascinated about GM. I don't think we have governed. The group from Mayo Clinic, Sethi and Farvanza and this group, they have done a lot to, a lot of favor to the entire uh, nephrology committee for understanding um, various glomerular nephritis, especially membranous nephropathy. So we have a targeted, we don't have a targeted therapy for FS, recurrent FSG, there's still a problem. Recurrent membranous, we do have somewhat target therapy. Recurrent IgA, we still give non-specific therapy. MPGN, cellar kinds, anti-complement. Recurrent HUSTTP, it's a very rare disease, but a devastating disease, we can give targeted therapy. So those things are very, very important. So in summary, let me divided into three parts. Pre-transplant intervention, when it comes to donor, promote living donor transplant, living donor paired exchange. Use kidneys with high KDPIs cautiously. Use kidneys like hep C and have a HIV positive organs. Recipient point of view, early referral for transplantation is still a problem in the United States. Preemptive transplant is a must. Medical management remains the cornerstone ability, immunization, cancer surveillance, all those things are important. In the transplant point of view, we are pushing toward more serological HLA typing, virtual cross match, and we have to perform transplant, at least in the disease donor, with at least one to DR mismatch, at least for younger recipient, because these patients, when they lose the kidney, come back for another transplant, you don't want them to be sensitized. 
So that's one advantage of doing it. But we haven't adopted that uh, practice yet. And using a weplet match, I already mentioned, it's the way to go. In the post-transplant intervention is still the fundamentals of transplantation is make the kidney work, prevent rejection, appropriate dose of immunosuppression, surveillance biopsy, therapy for reversing CM uh, and conversion to the latter step and select patient, therapy for reversing TCMR and ABMR. Infection is still a problem. We need to govern that. Recurrent disease is still a problem. And more importantly, general health maintenance of hypertension, diabetes, lipid, management of obesity, vaccination, all those things are important. Social determinants are still a huge problem in the United States. There are many patients who don't get access to transplant. They are, we, we have to create a more support system for non-adherence patients. They are patients as well. We need to give devices to improve the adherence, improve health literacy, which is not that easy. We need an oversight for long-term survival, which we have. We have only up to three years. We are requesting for five years at least. Careful transition from a pediatric to adolescent is very important because the young children, the young, young adults, they fall off and they don't really follow up the care and they lose the kidney and they go back on dialysis. Long-term survival is important. It's not an area where it is specific to nephrology and transplant surgeon, primary care physician, the industry. Uh, you know, all the surgical specialties, support therapy, basic science, translational research, data scientists, organ procurement agency, radiology, I can go on. So this is not a small group of people. It's not a village. It's an army of people that will make it possible for our long-term survival to further improve. So if I were to say, I cannot do this alone, none of us can do this alone. If you want to achieve anything, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's a famous African pro. That's what we have to use when it comes to transportation, especially with long-term survival. I have one plea to the members of the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation is you can showcase your data by working together, putting together a fantastic national database. You can put all other countries, including the United States, to shame by showing your volume, showing your strength, and plotting the graph, you can publish enough number of papers. You reach me out, if you want to help me in database, I'll be glad to help you at the big national level. I think it is a must. If you compile the data together, you will be really powerful in the national, international scene. And more importantly, you will tell the entire world what's the right way to do it. And I will stop there, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers and nice to see many of our friends. Thank you. Thank you, Hari, for that uh, excellent talk and covering it in time. Uh, I think you answered many of the questions, but I'm sure there may be a couple of questions and I ask uh, either AB or Jose if they are around or Sundar to orchestrate the questioning. Any questions? Uh, can I ask a question, Hari? Please. Go ahead, Bharat. Bharat, go ahead. Yeah. So, Hari, you said that uh, by doing virtual cross-match, uh, you are able to reduce the cold ischemia time. How do you do that? Because you'll still need to do HLA typing of the donor, right? Okay. So, the way it works, Let's look at the disease donor transplant. I'm not talking about living donor yeah, transplant. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. Right. Well, for disease donor transplant, the donor comes from a particular hospital. The first thing they will do with the blood group, they will do make sure there's no infection or anything else, and they will do the immediate tissue typing. The tissue typing will be done. So you have the tissue typing of the donor. When the tissue typing of the donor comes, then you look at your recipient list. Who are the patients in your list? who don't have the same antigen as that particular donor. Oh, I mean, look at so, the recipient list, who has that, look at so the antibody the standard, level. It's a standard thing to do tissue typing of the donor. Yes, absolutely. It, it is not the case over here at present. No, no, tissue typing of the donor is a must. But for a cross-match point of view, you are taking the donor lymphocytes and treat it with the recipient sera and look for the cytotoxicity, depending yeah. upon which method you use. 
Yeah. You don't need to do that. I agree. The I antibody agree. profile of the recipient, you know which HLA antigen the donor has. I can proceed for transplant by looking at it. It takes five minutes for me to do that. Right. But because obviously have... it occurs at some time one in the morning or two in the morning, the tissue typing directors are reluctant to do it because they lose the money. Not really. They can through the physical cross match next day after the fact. And we have published some beautiful couple of papers on that looking at the national trend. And that is going in that direction. Is there uh, any uh, sort of artificial intelligence to do the uh, matching like that? You can do the artificial intelligence for uh, donor exchange program, but here it has to be done um, by the tissue typing director or the person who is comfortable. I am personally comfortable. All we have is a histogram of the recipient with the antibody profile and you have in the left sheet the donor HLA antigen. You look at it and match it. It takes two minutes to look at it and they say, you know, this patient PRA is zero. He has never been sensitized. Patient has never gone through pregnancy or prior transplant. Proceed with the transplant. You will have a cold ischemia time of 14 hours instead of 17, 18 hours. Thank you, Dr. Hari Haran, for the wonderful talk. It's very encouraging to learn that uh, you know the overall long-term survival has increased, and that has been our experience as well. Considering the fact that the the kind of patients we are transplanting now are very different from the ones who received transplant 20, 20, 25 years ago. It's a wonderful talk, and uh, it's sad that we couldn't have you here physically. Maybe in future sometime we'll invite you for another meeting. Dr. Yes, Jose, in comments. Thank you, sir, for the excellent talk. Over to Dr. Chako, sir, and Dr. Sundar to conclude. Dr. Chako, sir, please, go ahead. Well, I don't, I think uh, all that remains, remains is for me to thank the organizers for permitting us to chair this session and to thank uh, Hari too for a wonderful talk. Nice to see. I thought you had actually woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Thanks, Hari. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hari. Excellent talk. Thank you.